Hello, and welcome to Exploring the Role of Gestures in Interface Design. I'm Amber Heinbachel, and I'm a Creative Director at Cantina. And I'm Allison Sigrist, Senior User Experience Consultant. Uh, we work together here in Boston. Um, Cantina is a creative technology agency that plans, designs, and builds connected experiences and product innovations. Uh, so real briefly before we get started, the topic of gesture was really interesting to both of us because I'm a musician and Amber is a painter uh, when we're not um, pushing pixels around. So uh, the parallels between the instruments and the design tools we use for those pursuits and the way we use our mobile and other computing devices really resonated for us. So we're really happy to be uh, sharing our insights on gesture with you. So personal computing has never been more personal. First, we personalize server rooms by crunching them into our homes in the form of the desktop computer. Then we made them even more personal when we transformed them into laptops. Now, amidst the mobile revolution, our lives, data, and digital world literally fit into our hands. The gap between the physical world and the digital world has been shortened to less than a millimeter. That's actually the thickness of touchscreen glass. At the same time, the digital world is also getting bigger, surrounding us in the form of our televisions and appliances, perhaps someday really soon, entire walls of our home or office. So given such a vast array of devices, there can't only be one way to interact with them. You know, can you imagine using a mouse to control a connected refrigerator? It wouldn't make sense. Plus, nobody wants mice in their kitchen. Uh, anyway, this is where gesture comes into play. Today we'll be talking about the history of gesture used to control our computing devices. And uh, hint, hint, it didn't start with the iPhone. Uh, we'll also be examining what works well today, as well as taking a look at what the near future could bring us. There's some really exciting stuff happening designed to make controlling devices that we surround ourselves with easier and more intuitive. Uh, so where are we today, and what do we mean when we talk about gestures and devices? So let's start with physical gestures. A physical gesture is a form of nonverbal communication in which visible body actions are used to communicate important messages, either in, in place of speech or together and in parallel with spoken words. When it comes to physical gestures, a simple gesture like a thumbs up is a simple sign of approval. However, if I'm using American Sign Language, a thumbs up can symbolize the number 10. If you, may, if you ask many Germans to count with their fingers, they will often start with their thumbs up as number one. Or, for example, if you're a hitchhiker on the side of the road, a thumbs up means you're trying to hitch a ride. But in some other cultures, it is regarded as an obscene insult equivalent to the middle finger. So, sorry in advance if I've offended anyone. Or how about when you nod your head up and down? In many cultures, it's used to indicate agreement. Have you ever wondered why we do this? Charles Darwin did while writing his book, Expressions of Emotions in Man and Animals, back in 1872. He actually sent out a questionnaire to missionaries, and among his findings, he discovered that nodding and head shaking turned out to be a really common gesture, but there are really some striking exceptions. It's actually the complete reverse in Bulgaria, where a nod up and down means no, and a shake side to side means yes. Each culture and individual has a unique way of communicating using gestures. While everyone has a unique way of interacting with the physical world, our devices are leaps and bounds behind our daily physical interactions. But it seems that with every device that is released, the capabilities to interpret our movements get, gets more and more robust. And it's only a matter of time before those devices that sense our motion are able to learn and distinguish us versus someone else based solely on the way that we move. So when we talk about physical gestures in terms of computing devices, we're talking about these gestures as motion gestures that an input device can pick up, such as a Wii controller, Xbox Connect, or Elite Motion. And so now let's talk about touch gestures. Touch screens, tablets, phones, kiosks. We pinch, swipe, point, and poke our way through interacting with these devices. These user interactions are all part of a long-standing gestural vocabulary defined by simple two-dimensional gestures like swipe to unlock and pinch to zoom. Most of the touch gestures we use are very simple, but even in our devices, we're sometimes required to learn to interact differently depending on the, um, on the device. On an iPhone, for example, you double tap the large button to toggle between open apps, while on a Google Nexus, it's just one tap on a software button. So touch gestures, like physical gestures, are the way we offer the input into our devices. How about 2D to 3D? So since the creation of touch screens, those gestures have redefined how we interact with our devices. But the problem we're having when we break down the boundary between the physical and the digital world is one thing. It's space. 
With the exception of motion detector devices like the Wii, Kinect, and Leap, we still mostly interact with our devices in a very 2D kind of way. We either have a mouse on a flat surface that we move along an X and a Y axis, or we touch a pad or a screen and we can only manipulate that device within two dimensions. Now, of course, we understand that there's a bit of a press on the screen. That's actually how capacitive screens work. The outside layer, meaning the glass, pushes down against the layer just beneath it to make a connection and where touch takes place. But for the most part, the depth of that touch does not vary, and the user really isn't aware of that movement between the glass and the layer below it. So once our fingers hit that screen, that's essentially where forward motion stops. But we know that our world is round, and you know it's not flat, so, when, so why do we interact with our devices in, in such a flat, two-dimensional way? What about the Z-axis? So I started thinking about the Z-axis when I saw a demonstration of the future Lely. It's a ukulele for your iPad, naturally. And the first thing I wondered was, how could you actually play this dynamically? Um, and this, the, the image we're seeing is actually a version 2, which uses an iPhone for the neck. But the first one I saw was really just, it was iPad only. Um, you know, but if you were playing an actual ukulele, you could hit the strings hard or soft, and you could also press down on the neck with varying pressure. So the future Lely can detect strumming speed, but not how hard or soft you're hitting the virtual strings. So our devices allow for click motion, but that's essentially a binary. You press or tap, and only the fact that it happens gets registered, not the force with which you did it. Of course, despite that, when my phone is acting up, I hit it harder, and it doesn't care. It, ignore, it ignores me. Um, so, uh, so then the future Lely led me down the path thinking about other musical instruments. Uh, and it really seems like the music industry has been dealing with the issues of touch and gesture expression for a long time. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, synthesizer keyboards only had one, only had on and off for the keys. Um, you set a volume, and that's where you were unless you manually turned the volume knob or hooked up a pedal to control it while your hands were busy playing. So it was a huge step forward when keyboards came out that had velocity sensitivity. That meant they would work much like an actual piano, where if you hit the keys harder or softer, the volume output would react accordingly. Um, that's actually where the piano gets its name. Pianoforte in Italian means soft, loud. Um, just a little fun fact for everybody. Um, but then, you know, the manufacturers of these synthesizer keyboards went even further, and they created something called aftertouch. This allowed the sound to be manipulated even after the key had sounded. You could press harder on the keys or even wiggle them side to side a little bit, and that allowed you to further change the sound after you'd made that first contact. In terms of expression, we're currently on the same journey as we were at those keyboards a few decades ago. Now, there's more at our fingertips than just playing a piano keyboard, since we can, use, we can move in the Y and X axes, and our devices are multi-touch interfaces. So that means they can discern one finger versus multiple fingers. So that's great. We're a little more advanced. But in terms of where we are, we're still in a similar, similar place to those early keyboards, though device capabilities are getting more and more expressive all the time. Although, did you realize that the iPad does support some Z-axis control? Um, I actually didn't realize that until recently. Uh, and the way it works, it's not actually, it can't tell how hard you're pressing by detecting the, the force, like the velocity with which your finger comes at the screen. But just basically, it's a physical mechanism, when you, because when you press harder, your finger flattens against the screen more. So it extrapolates the force by reading how flat your fingertip is when it's pushed against the screen. Uh, and guess where you can find that velocity sensitivity? GarageBand. Uh, you can tap a virtual keyboard, harder or softer, and that velocity will be detected. So here we are back at musical instruments. It might be beginning to feel like that's the only application for Z-axis control. And if it is, why bother talking about it here, since it's only going to be useful for a small portion of the population. But it doesn't have to be that way. Another place where the sensitivity would work really well would be a graphics program. Yes, we're still maybe not the type of application that everyone uses, but probably more than more use graphics programs than music ones. Right now, if you want to draw a certain kind of line in most applications, you have to pick your brush and your stroke weight before you start drawing. But what if your finger could actually tell that sensitivity? So the lighter you, you moved your finger, the thinner and softer the line, whereas in the harder you pushed your finger, the darker and thicker the line would be. Um, and, and this kind of pressure sensitivity would be a great addition to games, too. You know, say you have a character that's walking along and needs to jump, you know, a small tap would be a little hop and a Hard tap would be a huge leap. Uh, or even some of the more mundane applications could, uh, could see the use of this. Um, could, this could come in handy. So say like text or spreadsheet applications. Uh, say you're color coding something. Uh, the, more you har like the harder you press, maybe more intense the color. So say something's very urgent. You, know, you press your finger harder and you get a deeper red as a background color. 
So there's just some examples of how touch sensitivity could really enhance the ways we enact, interact with our devices. So how did we get here? What's the history of touch gestures? Um, let's get back to the journey we're on to get to where we are today with touch-enabled devices. Well, it seems like the iPhone's introduction in 2007 was the birth of the touchscreen. Devices that use touch either via a stylus or with their hands have been around a lot longer. One of the earliest touch devices was called the Print Circuit Keyboard. It was built in 1962. Yes, again, it's a musical instrument. Um, we, went, we mentioned that music industry is in the forefront of interface design, didn't we? <laughs> the way it worked was that when a key was contacted, a small circuit was transmitted through the performer's finger from one conductive section to another. 1965 brought about the first capacitive touchscreen, and that's how our smartphones detect touch today. It was a device used for air traffic control, and that device was actually still in use into the 1990s. Through the rest of the 60s and 70s, there were more and more touch screens being developed, and they used a variety of ways to, to use touch, including capacitive and, both op and optical methods. But the early 80s brought on a flurry of new innovation. 1981 brought on a multi-touch screen, uh, excuse me, system for robots that could discern shape and orientation. 82 brought on the first multi-touch system for humans to input into a computer system. It was actually for drawing. We should note that the visual arts also helped propel a lot of the innovation and in interface design for gestures as well as music. In 1983, the first paper that discussed using touch screens to control soft machines was published. 84 brought the first multi-touch screen, and then 1985, the first multi-touch tab tablet was created. It's tempting to recount the entire timeline for you, but as you can see, the roots of our touch devices that we have in our pockets today run a lot deeper than you may have realized. All right, so now enter the Connect, the Wii, and the Leap, and other input devices that capture motion. So these afford us three dimensions, but there's still an issue that keeps these from being that easy to use. For instance, you should see me trying to navigate a Netflix search on the Wii. Miming things in the air is a very common thing to do, but the prospect and reality of doing this for long periods of time with great pre precision is really tiring. So why is that? We've all seen these scenes in Iron Man or Minority Report where the characters are bringing up screens and they're moving them around in front of them, um, but they don't seem to do that very, for very long, do they? Uh, part of it is, you know, the scenes in the movies aren't that very long, but um, aren't, that, aren't very long, but uh, they probably wouldn't be doing it for very long if it was reality either. Uh, it might seem counterintuitive, but we actually get less tired if we have some resistance to push against. Our fingers and hands are incredibly sensitive, and it's helpful to use that sensitivity. If we're just moving our hands in the air to try to affect a change on the screen, it's not that satisfying because we're only outputting. We're not getting any input back for our efforts. Not too many people can use their arms raised in the air for long periods of time. All right, here we are back at music. One example of someone who can do that is an orchestra conductor, but even they use a baton. Not only does it provide something for the orchestra, orchestra to see, it also has a weighted handle, which improves its handling for the conductor. It's not really heavy, but provides just enough resistance and heft to make their movements easier. So these controllers, where you don't touch anything, may not really work that well over long periods of time, simply because by not providing this with any kind of resistance would prove to be really tiring. Uh, yet there's at least one place where the leap motion is being used for quote-unquote real work. Uh, if you, uh, and if you haven't encountered the leap yet, it's a small device that you can place in front of your keyboard to detect hand gestures that you can use to control your computer instead of a mouse. So Elon Musk, who's the CEO and CTO of SpaceX, right, that's the company that's going to take us all on trips into outer space, he introduced the Leap Motion as a controller of their CAD systems. Uh, in a clip we're going to show in a second, he even refers to their first attempt of using the Leap as fun. Not that work shouldn't be fun, um, but they, sim they quickly moved... And then catch it. So this is kind of fun, a fun way to interface with what is really a very complex model. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, but they, they quickly moved into more complex uses, even projecting the designs on glass, much like the cinematic representations we mentioned earlier. This video shows what looks like engineers manipulating the models using the combination of hand gestures some of which are the standard ones we recognize, and others that look like they may be custom. What's not shown is the creation of these models. Uh, it, the engineers are doing very fine-tuned work in the creation. Mostly, we see them moving the models around and highlighting different sections. 
So some people might see this as a failure. Like, see, it's difficult to use these motion controllers to do all the work, so they obviously are useless. But there's no rule that says if we choose a tool for one part of our work, that we're bound to use it for the other parts where it doesn't work as well. Presumably, these engineers are working close to the monitors at their desks while they're building the models, probably using mice or styluses. But being able to step back and manipulate these models from a different perspective for review is very valuable. This review usage also isn't so intensive that your arms are in the air for hours at a time. You gesture, pointing, grasping, or turning, and then your arms can rest while you view. It also facilitates collaboration, since more than one person can join in the review and also use gesture to manipulate what's on screen. This is a terrific use case for the leap. So if we get to a point where we can have velocity sensitivity on our touch devices, we can use the sensitivity in our, in our hands and our nerve endings in our fingers to vary the pressure and feel of what we're doing when we use gestural devices. So what about the area above and in front of our devices? If we're using an in-air input device, sort of like the LEAP, where's the line between the negative and the positive Z? In terms of touch screens, it's easy, at least in concept. It's the screen. But with motion detection input devices, how can we tell what the point of zero Z is? We'd have to take a miming class to learn out how to find the edges of a fake wall. So one interesting and promising device that gets us a little bit closer, closer to the usable control is actually called a myo armband. For one thing, it seems to be tapping into the right physiological process that really picks up the fine motor movements in our tendons and for forearms. The tendons that connect our fingers attach to our forearm just below the elbow. So if you grab one of your arms right underneath your elbow and wiggle your fingers, you can actually feel each one of your tendons moving. The myo armband actually wraps around this area, and that's why it holds so much promise over other armbands that use cameras only to capture motion. The, the myo armband is literally right on top of the action. But another promising thing is that the myo armband will actually be able to provide feedback right back into your arm. So when you're using it, the information could vibrate while you're reaching closer to a wall so that you know that you're actually getting closer. So it starts to access that Z access that we're, that we're talking about here. And so let's talk a bit more about feedback in terms of our touch devices. That was a good segue. Uh, one of the early complaints, or maybe it's an ongoing complaint, is that typing on a phone or tablet is really difficult because you're basically just tapping your fingers on a flat surface that doesn't have any detectable give to it. To alleviate this issue, some devices provide haptic feedback. This feedback basically just takes the form of a vibration when you touch the device. So far, the vibration isn't really localized. The whole device vibrates, but since you're touching it in one area, your brain kind of fills in the difference and makes you think that it's just vibrating under your finger. Uh, but just about a year ago, Apple filed a patent for a more robust haptic system that will localize the feedback. So if you press in one area, it'll vibrate, but prevent the vibration from moving to another area. So it'll actually feel even more like the feedback is happening only under your finger. A couple other things that are going on in this area. Microsoft Research has demonstrated a 3D monitor with haptic touch that also contains force detectors. So remember before, we talked about um, right now, touch velocity is kind of hacked, I guess you could say, by figuring out how flat your finger is. In this case, it actually will detect the velocity with which your finger comes into that screen. Um, so this combination of force and haptic will actually let you sort of feel where you are in the 3D space that you're touching. And the goal for this monitor is actually for medical uses. So for instance, if you're navigating the patient's brain scan, you could actually sort of reach into their skull and be able to feel where treatment is needed. And it's a little less invasive than doing it on a real life person. Uh, and then uh, also Fujitsu has just revealed a prototype just uh, about a month ago, a couple months ago, that takes haptic feedback a step or 10 before it's gone before. This device emits ultrasonic vibrations that actually push your finger off the screen a little bit as you touch. And the result is that, the feel, is that um, you feel that the surface is slippery. And then if they pulse, uh, they, yeah, they vary the pulses of these um, vibrations. They can emulate the feeling of bumpiness or roughness. So imagine like a kid's book with, um, you know, on like different animals. So you have a kid's book on a tablet. You could actually um, feel, the, feel the fuzzy kitty or feel the slimy whatever, snake. fish, something snake. <laughs> I'm like, what's slimy? <laughs> uh, and uh, speaking of texture, although this isn't exactly haptic, uh, and it's not something we're going to see on our devices you know, next year, but there are actually, some people are working on screens that will actually grow a raised button or region that you can touch. So for example, if a keypad comes up on screen, buttons will rise from the screen so you can feel the keyboard. 
and that's being uh, done with a layer of uh, fluid beneath the screen and it just delivers the fluid to the right area and pushes the, the screen up. So as you can see, our touch devices won't be going obsolete anytime soon. So standardization, what makes sense? As we've talked about, the history of touch and gesture for device control is several decades long, and a lot of the gestures we're using today were standardized years ago. Luckily, with touch and gesture, the device really lends themselves to the natural interaction. We push, touch, point, wave, and wave in front of them in, order, in the way that we naturally move. One project from 1983 called Video Place was actually created by an artist named Myron Kruger. He talked about how he resented having to use a keyboard to create his visual art, whereas if he was using a, another medium other than a computer, we, he would be able to use traditional artist tools. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, we're well, back to graphic design. Um, he then set out to create a system which was mostly created out of rear-mounted cameras and projections in order to ca capture a user's motion and translate it onto the screen. What's remarkable about this piece is that he's using a lot of the same gestures that we use today, including pinch to scale, grasping, and the simple drawing shapes that we use with one finger. So that's great. We could say Myron did all the work for us, so we're all set. Well, there's still a lot of common gestures. Um, there's still a lot of common gestures that we use today, but there's actually no ability to customize or change those gestures for your own particular preferences. So right now it can feel limiting. I mean, who are you to tell me what gesture I can use to complete an action? But in reality, standards are there to provide regularity. They exist so that one person knows essentially what to expect when they pick up a device that they are familiar with, but it isn't their own. Even a little bit of minor customization to a regular gesture can throw a user off. For example, I always set my Mac's trackpad to take a one-finger tap as a click, in addition to a regular push-down uh, click. But if I have to use a colleague's machine, I, almost, I often get slightly flummoxed when I first get on it because I can't understand why the click isn't moving, unless I remember that my customization isn't actually the default for the device. But the best part is, I actually understand what the standard is. So after a few frustrated taps and clicks, I can actually revert back to the default behavior and get my work done on someone else's machine. So it's always a good idea for us as interaction designers to create a default behavior so that users can understand. But you might think that another option on the other end of the spectrum is to provide um, every single possible gesture. There's no rules and the user can actually define them all for themselves. But then you could find yourself having a need needing the coordination of an acrobat to accomplish tasks, not to mention having to remember all of your unique movements without a standard. So the answer is really a balance between the two, the two approaches. One, provide a standard, but also allow for customization and take individual preferences in mind. Another aspect we have to take into consideration with gesture detecting devices is which gestures are meant to be detected and which aren't. Gesture detecting devices are much like other devices that take in data from the physical world. For instance, you can focus a camera lens, but it'll still pick up things you don't necessarily notice. And microphones, too. They hear everything they're pointed at, even if you don't notice what, what's being said or uh, the noises that are in the environment. But our brains are selective. That's how they're able to run our bodies efficiently. You know, if they took in every single piece of data in the world, we would just be exhausted and we wouldn't be able to really function beyond just taking that data in. Um, so, you know, how we can be in a cafe and uh, we're heads down, we're working, and then suddenly a friend comes in, they see us, and they shout our name, and we hear it. Uh, or, on the other hand, we're so we're so focused on our work, we don't hear it because our brain says, "Nope, we're shutting everything out. We're gonna just focus on this." And the person has to come over and tap us on the shoulder to get our uh, to get our attention. And it's that selectivity that allows our brains to be efficient. So the question is, where will these gesture translators fall in their level of motion detection? When it comes to gesture recognition and sensitivity, how will those devices tune out the noise and tune into me? So in the Elon Musk video we, we saw a little while ago, there was a moment that was illustrated of this issue of selectivity. Let's take a quick look. Now we'll go, to, go from this to what we were able to advance to a few weeks after the wireframe, which is to, to actually use a, a... All right, see what happened there? While he was demonstrating the use of the leap motion, he made a stop gesture. But as he turned back and dropped his arm, it triggered another motion, and the wireframe and screen started spinning again. The computer couldn't discern his intention. It saw a movement and it reacted to it. 
So the question is, how do we set those thresholds? If the sensitivity is too high, you either have to be very, very precise or very big in your gesturing. And if it's too low, you'll be triggering actions you don't intend to. Uh, for instance, um, you know, the, one of the uh, people have been using the, the Leap Protect, uh, not the Leap, the uh, Nest Protect, the new uh, smoke detector. And apparently it has this feature where if you burn your toast, you can um, shut it off by waving at it. But uh, people who've been using it in the real world, they have to wave really, really big. And I guess it's just basically so that the uh, Nest Protect knows that you're not actually on fire and you're rolling around and that you are actually intending to uh, turn it off manually. But, um, but that's a case of the selectivity. It's the threshold is set very high and you have to make a very large gesture to get the device to recognize. Um, but one way devices may be able to determine intention is to take in multiple points of data through multiple gestures. So in this example we just saw, if the leap was looking for motion and eye contact both, it might have detected the hand motion that made the model start spinning, but if it also detected that Mr. Musk's uh, uh, head was turned and his eyes were not on the monitor, the system could have put those two pieces together and come to the conclusion the hand gesture was not actually meant to be read by the computer and the previous motion of stop was the last thing that it should have paid attention to. It would be a kind of triangulation between data points which would enable much greater precision and a step closer to having the computer determine our intention. So what does the future look like? So we already have the device in our pockets and on our, we already have these devices in our pockets or on our desks that are so much more powerful than anything that has come before. And yet there's still so much research and so many experimental prior, prototypes coming in every day. Will gesture ever replace touch? Will keyboards and mice disappear? Bill Buxton said, everything is best for something and worse for something else. The problem is, when someone hits a home run with one technology in one area, people try to ride on the coattails of success and indiscriminately deploy the same technology in the too often misguided blind hope that the new deployment will achieve the same success. What he's really referring to here is basically use the right tool for the right job. And sometimes it's like we're searching for a one one technology fits all technologies. Uh, technology, I said that a lot in one sentence. Um, but we're already seeing that a lot today. These technologies are actually additive. We add tools to our toolboxes, but we don't completely replace them with an all-in-one all in tool that actually solves all problems for once. There's really no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. Here's one vision of the future that illustrates this integration of the multiple technologies that we could use in our everyday lives. Okay, so we might not see everything shown here this year, but watch for the gestures. They really tie everything together.
All right, that's fun, huh? Um, I don't know, I think my, uh, my dental hygiene might suffer a little bit if I uh, were reading news in my mirror while I was brushing my teeth. But I really want that translucent monitor where I can put a message out the back for my colleague to read. But notice in that scene, and remember, that there's still a mouse and a keyboard in use. And let's be honest, it's really still the most straightforward way to enter text using a keyboard. Uh, but there were touch monitors and physical gesture detectors all seamlessly woven, in, woven together in ways that are easy for us to use. Even right at the beginning, did you see it? The alarm went off and he waved over the device to silence it, and then he immediately picked it up and started touching it. And that's what, device, what, <laughs> that's what gesture provides for us. The ability to interact with our devices in the most natural and intuitive way possible. As technology gets better and more robust, using these devices will only become easier to use and more woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. So thank you very much. Thanks.